debate going on, but really he's been the number one guy. He's number one on the depth chart. Will he be your guy this year? That depends on how the season goes. You want a pleasant experience. And I think this will help make that happen. If you think the players are making a lot of money, what do you think the owners are making? Let's keep that in mind. Hey, I'm Jeff Skaversky. On this episode of Inside the Huddle, presented by Sports Kita, I catch up with Pittsburgh sportscaster Andrew Stocky. He's been covering the Steelers, Penguins, and Pirates for ABC out there since the mid-90s. We will talk to him about everything going on at Steelers camp. Of course, they're making the transition out there. Ben Roethlisberger retired. It's now either Mitch Trubisky or Kenny Pickett, a quarterback. What's going to happen? What's going on out there heading into the season who might the quarterback be? He has great insight for us. Also, the pressure from the fan base on head coach Mike Tomlin. And we'll talk about the controversial name change. Heinz Field is no more. We'll talk about that and everything else going on in Pittsburgh, including Barry Bonds and his relationship with the city after he left there years ago. That and more on this episode of Inside the Huddle. <laughs> Hey, Andrew, great to see you. I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to talk to you. So it's weird. I mean, you think about Pittsburgh, you think about the Steelers, but for the first time in forever, I don't want to call it rebuilding. Some people like to call it retooling. I mean, the Steelers situation is kind of weird. I mean, no Big Ben. And so now what's going to happen with this team? Well, first of all, you cannot use the R word around here. Rebuild, retool, can't use that word. What are we using? Uh, what are we going to use? <laughs> well, they, they they still think basically they're they're on a path towards being successful. And it's just adding a few elements. I mean, defensively, they feel very confident. Uh, they have a better unit. Everybody's back and healthy, which is one of the most important things because they couldn't stop the run because nobody was healthy a year ago. Um, the, the question is, who's going to be the quarterback? Uh, you know, you draft Kenny Pickett first round. So there's a pressure to start him. Uh, Mitch Trubisky, you sign him thinking he's probably going to be your starter before you draft Pickett. And then you have Mason Rudolph, who has the most experience of anybody in this organization at quarterback currently, but clearly has not performed well enough to be the starter. So what's going to happen is Trubisky's going to start the season. I mean, there's this debate going on, but really he's been the number one guy. He's number one on the depth chart. He brings the most experience in terms of being successful as an NFL quarterback. And then let's see how it plays out. Pickett is your guy. Will he be your guy this year? That depends on how the season goes. And as for Mason Rudolph, I mean, as much as he may not have a place here, he is a strong backup quarterback, and you just don't want to get rid of him right now. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds over the next two or three weeks. Uh, my feeling, I think all three are there on opening day, and it's Trubisky, Rudolph, Pickett. You think Pickett's third on the depth chart? Yeah. I mean – Unless something really happens in these three games, I just think right now that's the smartest play at the moment. Um, like I said, there is a pressure to move him up to number two, but he's got to show it out there on the field. And, you know, practice, you see one thing, obviously. But until we get into a game situation, we've got one this week against Seattle, we're really not going to know where he is in his development and if he's ready to be number two. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, a lot of quarterbacks that get drafted high in first round, things like that, they come in with expectations and pressure. And obviously to move into, you know, Big Ben's role and mm -hmm. he's an iconic quarterback, there is that pressure. But he knows the city so well. I mean, he played in college in the city at Pitt. He's the Panthers' all-time leading passer. So is there less pressure in a sense because he understands the city? Or do you think filling those shoes of Ben Roethlisberger, they just want to kind of pump the brakes per se? I think they want to pump the brakes. I mean, you're right. He knows the city. He knows the system. I mean, heck, he practiced right next to the Steelers for five years. So he knows what's going on. Matt Canada, the offensive coordinator, he knows. So he knows what's going on. I think it's it's going to be one of those gradual things. Uh, I, I really do. I'm, like this, like I said, there's no hurry for him to start. This team's not so downtrodden. They can't be successful without him. Uh, but I think eventually he will be that guy. The question is, does that happen this season? And that's a question, I mean, I don't think any of us can answer. Kind of depends on how the season plays out. Because you remember, when Ben was drafted here, he wasn't supposed to be the starter. All of a sudden, Tommy Maddox gets hurt, and game number two, he's in there. Right. Yeah, I mean, look, you don't know how it's going to play out. Injuries, things like that, trades, everything like that. But it seems like, you know, you don't want to use the R word, rebuild, retool, whatever you want to call it. Um, but when you look at the division, mm -hmm. the Steelers have owned the division for decades. And now it seems like there's a shift, whether it's the Browns, whether it's the Bengals. 
to be a serious long-term shift. How much pressure is on Mike Tomlin to do this quickly? Or do you think he's built up enough, um, you know, enough of a window, lack of a better term, to be able to withstand a few down years as they're making this perhaps transition, if we're not going to use an R word, but do you think he's built up enough or do you think there's pressure on Mike Tomlin to really just continue to be, you know, the Kings of that division? I think the pressure is on Mike Tomlin. I think from the fan base, there's no question about that. They haven't won a playoff game in five years. Right. That, that's the first problem. You know, you get to the playoffs and you don't win. I think with management, they're a little bit more patient. Um, I don't think this team is really that far away in a division where the Bengals clearly are the class, but now they're going to be playing first place schedule. The right. Baltimore Ravens, you're just never sure what they're right. going to be. They'll be competitive, but will they be a playoff team? And as for the Browns, this whole Deshaun Watson situation is such a mess. I mean, this team, remember the Browns came in here two years ago and blew out the Steelers. Right. And I thought that was the turning point. Right. Since then, they've just been on this downhill, downhill slide. So the division is going through a change, but I don't think the Bengals are so much better than everybody else that the Steelers can't be competitive and at least make a run in this division. Well, yeah, and it's interesting because just the way it kind of plays out, you just think – and you look at the roster, they're so young. And look, you know, they have a promising quarterback that they just drafted. And the running back situation, I mean, makes the Pro Bowl in his first mm -hmm. year. So you see those pieces. Mm -hmm. Is it a matter of just small development and staying healthy for the entire team to make that, I don't say surprise people, but to be in that conversation? I think that's a big part of it. Health. Health was a big concern a year ago. I think you've added some pieces to this draft besides picking a uh, picket. There's George Pickens, receiver, uh, who that's going to get been, confusing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> imagine when they start throwing to one. Pickett, Pickett throws to Pickens. Uh, George Pickens has been the star of this training camp. This kid has all sorts of talent, ability, hard work. I guess I equate it to this is what Chase Claypool should be, right. and George Pickens is there right now. This is a kid, a star on the rise, and a real addition to this offense. And I think that's the one thing I think people are going to be impressed with what this kid does as a receiver. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say he's rookie of the year right now, but I'm going to say I've seen first team NFL, all rookie team based on what I've seen so far. Yeah. And just how weird is Steelers training camp right now without that larger than life quarterback in Ben Roethlisberger? I mean, he's, you know, one of the greatest quarterbacks in franchise history. Um, you know, I assume a hall of famer, right? I mean, and so to him not be there, is it just a weird feeling or is it just, is it normal? It's different. I mean, he was so much a leader, so much a part of this franchise. Uh, you're right. I mean, bigger than life. But you know what? There's a transition going on and you can feel it. Not it's, the R word, the T word. T word, transition. I mean, beyond Ben, uh, you know, you have new coaches in there. Uh, they're back at St. Vincent College going through training camp, which they haven't done in three years. There are new leaders emerging. Uh, Cam, this is really Cam Hayward's team. And Cam is different from Ben. I mean, Cam is somebody who does fire people up, but I think he's much more uh, cerebral, uh, more of, you know, follow my actions, not always my words. And I think you get that feeling. It's a quiet confidence instead of a louder confidence. Not that Ben was a big talker, but you got the sense he was his personality that right. had everybody kind of take that step up. It's a little different now. But you know what? I, I kind of, I, I, I can appreciate that change because, you know, it's him and Ben's team, if you think about it, for 10 plus years, at least from Super Bowl 40 on. And now we're seeing new leaders and a new style and hopefully maybe a, a turning of the page in terms of the Steelers of old, who you know were specifically a team that was all about defense and, and throwing the football, a team that runs the football hopefully a lot better, and a team that, um, you know, when they get to the postseason, they know how to win. That's that's the most important thing. They got right. they have to win the postseason. Right. What do you think changed? Was it just age with Roethlisberger and the team just kind of – you know, just a different team when you talk about, okay, they haven't won a playoff game since what, 2016. Mm -hmm. is, is it a situation where Ben was just getting older and it just wasn't as good per se, or was it just the team just wasn't there? And look, when you line up, who knows what can happen? The, the team itself was not as good as previous teams. I mean, since Super Bowl 45, since they lost the Packers. Uh, they've been good teams, not great teams. They've lost a lot of key players. Uh, yes, Ben has gotten older, and I think last year you saw the fact that the one thing about Ben that was great was his ability to keep plays alive and to move around. But that's always been that. his. That's always been his mo. I feel like for a big guy that can, and he couldn't do that last year. That was quite clear. He didn't have that mobility. Yeah, and that's a that's a function of age. So in many ways, the quarterback position has been upgraded because you have more mobility now. 
Um, so, and I think also a lot of it was, you know, let's put on Ben's shoulder and let shoulders and let's see if he can win it. And that's a lot to ask of a quarterback who's in his you know late thirties. And that kind of showed against the, the Browns two years ago in the playoffs and against Kansas city last year, clearly they were outgunned. You know, they just didn't have the horses to compete. So all those things, I, I think with, with Ben moving on now, you, you can change a lot of things. You can do a lot of things offensively. You couldn't do, you have more flexibility and maybe you're able to bring in players you couldn't bring in before it's a different mindset because the leader of that offense is no longer there. What would you put the odds on him pulling a Tom Brady and coming back? Zero. Zero. I'm sorry, negative. Let's say negative. I watched him play golf up in New Jersey last week. I don't know why he would even try to come back and play. <laughs> not the why? way he's a great golfer. <laughs> okay. But, but does he, does he just not have, is he just, is he, tr he just feel like he's truly done? Yes. Yes. There was nothing. Uh, and you see him now, he's really enjoying retirement. You see him, uh, like he threw out the first pitch at a pirate game. He's, uh, you see him in places you don't normally see him. He's playing a lot of golf. He's spending time with his family. I, I don't, I don't see it happening. I mean, I think he, he ran his course. And even if he did come back, you know, I doubt he would come back to another team. I, I highly doubt it. Right. And when you talk about guys that do retire, that first year or two is tough because their bodies, you know, it's re they're ready for training camp. You mm -hmm. know, they, a lot of guys you talk to, they're, they're just ready to kind of get going. And they almost don't know what to do with themselves. And that's all he's known is to play football. And so I'm sure in the back of his mind, may maybe he's, whether he wants to come back or not, is going – this just feels a little different. You know? and it is different. I'm sure. I'm still, I'm sure he's still trying to figure out what is his role moving forward. I mean, I don't really see him as a TV analyst. I, I just, I never have. Uh, not that I don't think he would be good at it. I just don't see him as that kind of person. So I don't know what business endeavor he may get involved with, but it's quite clear. I think the football part is done and he is moving on with his life and he's given no hint or indication. I mean, we haven't seen him at training camp at all. He hasn't shown up at offseason practices just to stop by and say hello. Uh, you know, he talks to uh, the current players. He had Kenny Pickett over for dinner. He had Mr. Trubisky and his wife over for dinner. So he still has those relationships. But in terms of being a part of this team, it's quite clear he has taken that step away as long as Steelers to move forward and he's moving on with his life. Yeah, and the relationships Big Ben has with the current players and the current quarterbacks, you talk about Pickett and trying to maybe from a distance teach him what it takes to be successful and not only in the NFL, but in – Pittsburgh, I mean, it's all Steelers. I mean, the Pirates don't even really exist, right? I mean, just because well, they, they, have... play, they still play games. <laughs> no, I know, but like, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they haven't been good in forever. And so, right. you know, you look at th that city, what it takes to be successful and, and Mike Tomlin and everything else. And, and so, how much can those guys, and Trubisky's been around the league, but, but Pickett in particular, mm -hmm. the future really of the team, yeah. how much can they learn from Big Ben from a distance if he's having them over for dinner and things like that? Mm -hmm. I'm sure they've talked shop. I'm sure he's shared insights. And I also think, and Kenny has said, look, if I need to talk to him, we can talk. But I also think they're, they're, they're different quarterbacks and different styles. Sure. And I, I, think, I think Kenny learned a lot just being a pit. I mean, he talked to Mike Tomlin. He was able to talk to Ben Roethlisberger. I think he's already had that conversation. So maybe if he picks his brain, it might be a small thing. But I think he knows who he is and what kind of quarterback he can be on this level. Uh, I've watched Kenny for five years play, and I just think he's, he's a winner. He finds a way to win. And that may sound cliche, but in the National Football League, that's what it takes. I mean, everybody's got the same 40 time. Everybody throws the ball about the same. It's that ability to win, that when you're down by a touchdown, how do you come back and win the game? And Kenny has shown that in college. And I really think that fifth year at Pitt was huge. I mean, he doesn't get taken in the first round. That doesn't happen. Right. He doesn't become the quarterback he is unless he has that fifth year. So I, I think he's in a good place right now. And if he needs Ben's advice, as he's told us before, uh, he, he can seek it out. Ben is not going to call and say, hey, maybe you should do this or this. You know, from a distance, you look at Mike Tomlin, you go, how can Steelers fans be impatient with Tomlin? I mean, he's one of the greatest coaches in the game and he's done it at a, such a high level. You're not going to have a winning season every year, mm -hmm. but the Steelers are an iconic NFL franchise and they've had such stability at head coach. Is it just human nature, you think, being in that city that, they go, all right, we haven't won a playoff game since 16. I think it's the fact that this is the this, – this town still loves the 70s, the Steelers of the 70s. You still have that feeling about being the city of champions. Uh, it is an impatient fan base, but they've gotten used to winning on a great level for so long. I mean, they may have playoffs for a number of years, 
uh, you know, during the Cowher years, even though they only won a Super Bowl, they were successful every year in making the playoffs. Right. So I think people are just impatient. And I think with Mike Tomlin, they, they know he's a good coach, but at the same time, they want results. I mean, we all know he's good, but if you don't win a playoff game over yeah. six years, you're going to upset an awful lot of people. And I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, go to the playoffs and win. If you get knocked out in the second round, fine, but get there and win. The Steelers have not done that. And the games they've lost in the playoffs, have been, they've been heartbreakingly close or absolute blowouts. You know, and, and that's the other thing, too. I mean, you, the emotions you go through as a Steeler fan. It's, a, it's an interesting town. I mean, I love living here. I think the folks are great. Uh, but we are maybe a little impatient. And we want a Super Bowl now because Steeler fans, that's what we, we expect in this town. I feel like, yeah, and I feel like that's almost East Coast mentality in a sense where people, you know, it, it, it's not like there's a beach in Pittsburgh, right? And so I feel like in the cities where there's, there's a beach, whether it's Miami or California, people are a little more relaxed. But on the East Coast, Philadelphia, Washington, Boston, um, you know, I would even throw Chicago into that. Mm. You know, these colder cities, especially people are impatient because the NFL football teams, I mean, they, 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 they rule. They rule the city. Well, they're also tough on the Penguins here. I mean, we've got a heck of a hockey team here that's won three Stanley Cups, you know, over the last decade plus. Yeah. Um, you know, people love hockey here. They love the Penguins. Sure. And when the Penguins don't do well, now they're going through that stretch where they haven't gotten past the first round in three or four years. And the Pirates now. <laughs> and, the, and the well, still. And the Pirates are the Pirates. But <laughs> but the, the bottom line is, I mean, because we've had success in recent years, that's what fans expect. There are a lot of cities, like for instance, I think about Jets fans getting upset. Well, I mean, they haven't won anything since Super Bowl three. Right. Meanwhile, here it has happened in the last ten to fifteen years. And you know your team can get there. And you know what it feels like. So when they don't do it, that's when it really starts to become an issue. And that's when you get impatient. Did you grow up in Pittsburgh? No, actually, I grew up in Connecticut. Okay. So going to Pittsburgh and seeing that passion, that fan base, mm -hmm. I mean, that has to just kind of get you pumped up to do your job every day when you feel that energy from, you know, your viewers and the fans knowing just how important – I don't want to call it life or death, but just how important and how diehard th those fans are. Well, you know, every Sunday, I mean, it's down, it's crazy in this town. Uh, this is the only town with a color scheme. Everything's black and gold. That's true. All the, all the teams, uh, the, the city flag, that's what you see on Friday, right? Wear Steeler gear. I mean, it's great because people here are passionate about the team because they, they truly love the team and they love what it represents. And it really is a part of who they are. And uh, it's always fun to, to talk to Steeler fans, have conversations. You know, I'm always asked, so, so how do the Steelers look right now at training camp? And I love having those conversations. And people will ask me something and they'll give me their opinion. And that's fine because they're passionate and love this football team. It's, it's a fun town to work in because sports is, uh, it's part of the fiber of this city. Right. And I think it always will be, regardless of where the teams are winning or losing. Yeah, and it has to be weird, too. There's so much change, obviously, going on with the Steelers. Now they have a new stadium name. You know, I still oh. want to call it Heinz Field. And look, it's a business, right? And so they're doing it business purposes. But but that's got to be strange, too, because it's refer. You know it as Heinz Field. People have lost their minds over this. They're, they're very upset. Really? Really? Oh, my goodness. I mean, there are T-shirts. Seriously, people wearing it says, it will always be Heinz Field to me. Heinz Field forever. I mean, seriously, you can buy these anywhere. People in this town, I don't think people have been this upset about anything as a group since the Jesse James non-catch in one of the games years ago. That was ruled a, a no touchdown. Um, you know, people who are just, they don't get it. They don't understand it. It's not a Pittsburgh company. That's the biggest frustration. Right. They, would, they would think like PPG Paints or U.S. Steel would buy the naming rights. Um, so people are really, really upset. And I don't know anybody who's going to call it Acreshire Stadium other than myself because I have to. Yeah, and so it's it's weird because you know th this company spends I don't know how much they spent. I mean, do, do you even know how much it cost the name? Uh, of the I've heard I've heard. Let's see, what was it? Was it one hundred and fifty million? So all right, so like yeah. let's just say it, it is that. What yeah. it, it's it's a ridiculous amount of money right. anyway, shape or form. So then you're, if you're this company going, hey, let's have our name on one of the most iconic, you know, team stadiums. Mm -hmm. And then here you go. Everyone's upset. You're, what, what is this company supposed to do? I mean, they're just doing what's best for their company. Meanwhile, everybody hates them. Well, the guy came in here who owns the company, which is based in Western Michigan. 
I said he was a Steeler fan growing up and went to games as a kid and so okay, on. Okay, so, so that helps. He said that. You know, I don't think anybody really is buying that or really cares. Right. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing is it's the money, obviously, this, this puts into the product. And if it improves the game day experience for fans, and this stadium is 20 plus years old. Which is weird to me because it feels like I think of that stadium as a new stadium. But, you know, you think about it, like the link is old. And even PN, how old's PNC Park now? I mean, it's, PNC Park is, they were built at the same time. So over 20 years old. Which is um, weird because PNC Park is an amazing baseball stadium. Oh. Mm-hmm. And uh, to think of like it's, it's old is insane to me. Well, it's, it's all in the way we look at stadiums now. I mean, you look at SoFi Stadium, for instance, out in California. I mean, that is state-of-the-art. That's what everybody wants now. So the Steelers obviously are not going to tear down Heinz Field. So what can they do to improve the experience for fans? And I think that's part of why they agreed to this deal, because it gives them the money to do that, to, to make the experience better. I'm not sure how, but it does. And fans, for you know, even though we're fans who love to bundle up in the cold and whatever, you want a pleasant experience. And I think this will help make that happen. Now, the other thing, too, is, I mean, will, will Heinz Field be here in 30 years? The way the way stadiums go up and down, you don't know. Right. That's your there is. Room. I feel like there's room there in that area, mm-hmm. that area in Pittsburgh. There's room there to build another. I could be wrong, but I feel like there is room if they were to go that route at some point. Well, I mean, it's it's always a possibility, you know, because of the way we look at stadiums now. I mean, I, we hope not. I mean, like for instance, PNC Park. There's no need to build another stadium. It's perfect. It is exactly what a baseball stadium should be. The whole idea with football stadiums, as you know, are luxury boxes and those kind of, that kind of seating and making that experience better. And over right. time, they've actually done that. They've added pieces. Um, but, you know, to say, will the stadium be here 10 years from now? It's tough to say in the world we live in. Yeah, it's weird because, like, you're right. I mean, everyone looks at that stadium experience. But I also go, that's such an overrated quality because at the end of the day, the fans, they just want to see a winning product. And you go to Lambeau. And yeah. I know Lambeau is an iconic stadium just because of the history there. But that stadium, I mean, you're sitting in bleachers, but most seats are bleachers. And it's, it, you know, it's not a nice stadium, but it's iconic. It, you think of Wrigley Field, you think of stadiums like that. It's yeah. just, it's an iconic place just because of what has happened within those walls. But it's not a nice stadium by any means. They don't really, you know, they've made additions, but they don't have these super luxury boxes. I mean, three, three were stadium was the same way. I mean, it was not a great place to watch a game, you know, maybe better for football than baseball, but it was, it was kind of drab, kind of cold, but it's what was inside that stadium right. that made it so special. So when they, when they did finally blow it up and tear it down, there was a lot of sadness because of all the history and the memories. Heinz Field has become that, uh, but it's a stadium that certainly is not perfect. Uh, I mean, I've gone there for games many times, both as a fan and a broadcaster. It's okay. You know, I'm not, thrilled with it there's things i would make better um you know like the open end thing has always kind of freaked me out the fact that you have an open end yeah uh, what scoreboard is and that completely affects the kicking game you know i almost wish it was enclosed in some some respects yeah no that's true and so you talk about three rivers and then the pirates they've had a couple years with mccutcheon and things mm-hmm. like that but other than that they haven't been good since the barry bonds andy van slyke the Nia, you know doug drabeck kind of days and so what is Barry Bonds' relationship with that city, or is it just it doesn't exist? Well, he was back here in 2014, I think, to present Andrew McCutcheon the MVP award, and he got an ovation that day. And uh, I think it was people were, were were happy to have him back. He hasn't been back really since, but recently they the Pirates formed their first Hall of Fame, just debuted it. Um, they don't have they, a, picked, they didn't have a Hall of they, Fame. They did not have one. They just started literally this past week, and they named 17 players. Uh, I'm sorry, 21. So 17 Pirates, four Negro League players who played here in Pittsburgh. Barry Bonds was not one of those people named. And there are people who are very upset about that. I mean, there are a lot of fans who are like, how can you leave Barry Bonds off the list? You know, now obviously people are going to say, well, the whole steroid thing. But as far as we know, that happened after he left Pittsburgh, not while he was here. So if you're judging him based on what he did as a Pittsburgh Pirate, how do you not have him in uh, in the Hall of Fame to start off? Because yeah, he was, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, my my take on the whole steroid thing is he was still the best player of his generation, right? And so if you go, the majority of players or a lot of players are taking it. He was still the best player of the generation before he allegedly took it and after. And so I'm just going, 
you know, him and Roger and Sammy and McGuire going, they were still these amazing players, you know, and I, I've had conversations with like Mike Schmidt and Mike Schmidt has said, Hey, if that was available when I was playing, I, I may have done it too, because that's just what was going on in the game at that time. But I still think there has to be some accountability for trying to gain an edge like that. This is not, you know, uh, uh, you know, cutting the ball or 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 stick them or something like that. This yeah. is this is something that's physically altering you as an athlete. Yeah, and I think there needs to be accountability. I uh, Barry Bonds' home run record uh, has never been something I've I've been comfortable with because of the fact that you know Hank Aaron did it the right way and right. did it through much more trying times than anything Barry Bonds went through. Yeah, so. I, I think Barry hires Hall of Fame. Yes, yes. I, I think he definitely belongs in there. Baseball Hall of Fame. No. Really? Yeah. Because I, I go the other way with it. I just go. I'm just like you know what? At the end of the day, like I get it and, and I understand, but put him in with an asterisk and, and 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 be done with it. And so you know that error was the steroid error, and so it wasn't just Bonds and and it was you know Pettit and Clemens. Right. And, so McGuire and you just go, they were, those guys were still the best players. And so, you know, and there were guys that were taking it that were just trying to, for recovery and things like that, that were just trying to be, you know, that they were like called like that 4A player where you're just, mm -hmm. they're trying to just, you know, get to the majors and stay there. Right. And I just right. go, they were still the greatest players. And so to, to think, okay, well, they don't, they don't belong in the hall because of the, I, I don't know. And that's just my opinion. And I get Oh, I can completely understand your opinion. I mean, you're you're right. I understand where you're coming from, uh, but at the same time, I mean, there are, there are players that didn't do that. Yeah, and the majority of players, as far as we know, didn't do that. And I just right. think there's something about I me. Mean, I'm not one of those baseball purists. I'm not, I'm not that kind of person. But I think anything you do outside the rules, like of that magnitude, to gain advantage, I don't think should be rewarded. Yeah. No, and I respect that opinion. And I told it's. I totally see that side. I totally see that side of it. And I totally get it. And it's a tough decision. I mean, look, Pete Rose was in Philadelphia this weekend and at, you know, the Phillies alumni weekend and uh, you know, he's honored and things like that. And Pete's still not in the hall of fame for, you know, all the gambling and stuff that, that, you know, and things off the field that he's dealt with and um, you know, as you know, has done. And so you just go, I see the debate and there's that debate. Okay. Should Pete Rose be in the hall of fame? Okay. He was betting on games but as mm -hmm. a manager, but he wasn't going in as a manager. He's going in as a player. And so look, I, you know, I, I get the debate and there's the baseball writers that are purists and some see it both ways, but you know, so bonds, it's interesting because bonds, I feel like has disappeared, you know, McGuire disappeared for a while and then became a hitting coach and Sosa kind of disappeared. It feels like Clemens kind of disappeared. These guys just vanished and especially bonds seems like he's completely vanished, even in San Francisco maybe he pops up here and there. I mean, I, I, we saw him here, like I said, 2014, I believe was the last time, and that was about it. Uh, I'm sure if he was invited back, he would come back. Uh, he was, I remember doing that press conference, how happy he was to be back. Um, you know, he didn't talk about like, you know, I, I, I hope, you know, people will forgive me or whatever, and or, or, you know, I should be in the Hall of Fame. He just embraced the moment. And I think he, he's part of an era of pirate baseball that people look back and say, you know, this team, had they won one of those championship series, things might have been different. And yeah. we would look at this team different. And maybe even the, the, the direction of the franchise would have been different. Yeah. And so that's that's the sadness. I mean, the fact that team was so talented. I mean, that outfield, Van Slyke, Barry Bonds, Bobby Bonilla, you have all those players. Uh, they were good enough to be world champions. And if they win one, maybe everything changes with the Pirates. Yeah. And, and look, you know, when you look at it through a fan's spectrum or their yeah. lens, you go, how could Bonds leave us and do this? And then – you know, you think about your own career, your own, just what you want to do in life and, you know, money and, you know, guys like Jason Worth got a lot, just a lot of grief for going from the Phillies to the Nationals and switching teams for a ridiculous amount of money. And you go, this is going to change this, that kind of money changes, you know, it's generational changing money. And, you know, the, maybe the bond situation was different, but look at the Bryce Harper situation. I mean, not only did he leave Washington, but he then goes to Philadelphia and my goodness, it, it, it's one of the, their hated rivals. Right. And so yeah, yeah. that burns them. So at least bonds went to the West coast, but I get it. I mean, you love this guy and then he burns, you know, he kind of burns the city and the fan base. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, money, let's face it. Everybody says it's, it's not about the money, but it's all about the money. And we know that. And, and it's hard to fault somebody for going for the money. And I always 
fans always say to me, they're like, you know, well, these athletes get paid way too much. I hear that all the time. You hear it all the time. I'm like, look, if you think the players are making a lot of money, what do you think the owners are making? Right. Those are the guys who are writing the checks, and they're not writing the checks and taking a loss. Right. Let's keep that in mind. Right. And I always go, they're entertainers. And so yeah. – they're entertainers and without the TV rights and that money that it doesn't, ex the money doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it is funny. Like when you, when you do dumb it down, I go the skill to throw a football or the skill to hit a baseball, um, you know, 200 years ago is a worthless skill. Yeah. Right. Like when you think right. about just like the moment in time, mm -hmm. 200 years ago, it was, I mean, there were guys even like the sixties and the fifties and the sixties that seventies even like had other jobs didn't like Joe Namath have like a job at like UPS or something like that, like in the off season to make ends meet. Right. And maybe that's, maybe that's not accurate, but I'm just, the job didn't pay well before the television rights. And also I mean, Kurt flood, you know, and the reserve clause, all that changed. Free agency changed it. Yeah. yeah you know, no, now you're right. The money is obscene, but let's be honest. I mean, if we weren't watching, we're not buying the merchandise and we're not listening to the games and we're not on the internet following these guys. They don't make this kind of money. So right. I always tell fans, look, it's up to you. You know, you're the reason why these people make all this money because you keep watching. Right. And if you don't so, watch. Yeah. And it's also, by the way, one of the only professions where the money is advertised. I mean, like yeah. people don't know what you make. Like people mm -hmm. don't go, hey, uh, Andrew just signed this uh, deal to stay as a sportscaster in Pittsburgh for, you know, whatever. Right. Nobody knows anyone else's salary and what other companies allow you in to interview their employee. It is a weird, like when you dumb it down, it's a mm -hmm. weird business. And, and you know, but it's, it's also what we love about sports. We love right. thinking about figuring out the salary cap. We love talking about, okay, this guy made this much money, but this guy makes this much money. That's part of why sports, we talk about it, why we watch it, because we know all the numbers and, and the salary included. So yeah, it's a soap, we do yell it's, how much these guys make, but at the same time, we want to know. Yeah, it's a soap opera. I mean, it's literally <laughs> like it's it's a soap opera played out. It's, you know, mm -hmm. Desperate Housewives. Yeah. You know, it's Desperate Housewives or the Kardashians, <laughs> but with, uh, you know, a football, baseball, bat, things like that, hockey stick and things like that. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. It was great to catch up and talk about the Steelers and the transition. We won't say uh, retool or... Um, <laughs> You, you know, can call it whatever like, you want to. This is this is the Steelers telling me we don't oh, call okay. it that. So <laughs> okay, that's their thing. Well, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Great insight into what's going on at Steelers camp. Jeff, is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Great insight there on what's going on with the Steelers as well as the Pirates and the city of Pittsburgh. If you like the show, click the subscribe button bottom of your screen. Also, if you hit the bell button on YouTube, I'll send you an alert. Also, you can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all your favorite podcast apps. Click on the links in the description below. Thanks for watching and listening. I'm Jeff Skaversky for this episode of Inside the Huddle, presented by Sportskeeda. Like